Hello, welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. This is David Bonson. I am the Chief Investment Officer and Managing Partner here at the Bonson Group. And in case you can't tell, I'm back in our Newport Beach studio, and uh, we are pretty excited to have some changes going on. I'm going to do a little housekeeping first and then get into all the market stuff. Let me get the housekeeping out of the way. Um, hopefully, if you're listening to this podcast, you also receive into your feed the COVID and Markets podcast, which we've been doing um, for a while daily, for actually months and months daily, and then most days, um, you know, going back to quarantine and so forth. Our plan right now is to retire the COVIDandmarkets.com daily entries as of next Tuesday, which I believe is the 29th of September. That'll be the last one. And then on Thursday, October the 1st, to officially launch our new property called the DC Today. Um, And of course, the DC, you could think of it as a dividend cafe, and you could also think of it as Washington, DC. But the point being, it's a daily. Uh, market recap. And I do intend for it to be a lot more succinct than COVID and markets was. There will be uh, bullet points each day covering the Fed, covering housing, and still covering COVID news as warranted. I don't want to obsess over the COVID news anymore. That's kind of what's driving a lot of this. And I yet I also believe that a lot of clients have benefited from us having that daily communication. So I intend to keep it going. Um, but in the meantime, this here, Dividend Cafe, will continue to be our weekly offering, the major kind of weekly commentary, which has been near and dear to my heart for for 12 years now. And I'm going to kind of even reorganize that a little bit. Um, Basically think of this week's Dividend Cafe as like the exact opposite of everything I want the Dividend Cafe to be going forward, where if you do read Dividend Cafe, um, you'll see this week that I kind of bounce around a number of different topics. It's you know, there's headlines and then kind of a treatment on what's going on with this, what's going on with that, and so forth. And and I've been doing it that way for a long time, and there's still going to be some of that. But I really want to get a lot of that captured into the D.C. today, Monday through Thursday. If there's something that comes up about global trade that I want to share or an update in our view of the oil sector or things like that, I'm, I want to encompass that into Monday through Thursday. And as much as possible, try to make Dividend Cafe a really comprehensive, really productive, really um, relatable, uh, but but significant single topic type of weekly commentary. And there will be a lot of weeks where there might be more than one thing to cover or a lot of weeks where multiple topics need to be treated together uh, that are kind of integrated. So we'll see how it shapes. I'm going to be very open to anyone's feedback, both positive and negative, but I'm excited to, to kind of reorganize some of our offerings and uh, the team here at Bonson Group has been working really hard to make all this happen from the production side and web and uh, and just everything that goes into it. There, there's um, where there's a lot that has had to happen, and, and here we are. We'll give it a shot. So in the meantime, um, as far as Divin Cafe here goes this week, the the kind of weekly recap is most certainly that September has been a very odd month. You know, we're not done yet. We'll see where things go for the last four days of the market month next week. But we are looking at multiple weeks here of continued pressure in markets, and it has still been largely concentrated in the technology sector. And the NASDAQ, from its high level, which came in the middle of the day on September 2nd, to where we were as of early morning Friday. I'm recording on this in the middle of the market day Friday, and everything's actually up a little bit right now, but it's been going up and down and up and down all day, so I'm not even going to venture to guess where we end up today. But more or less, NASDAQ was down about 12 or 13% from its high level to low level. S&P, a little less than that. Dow, about 5 or 6%. And, and so everything's down, but it's been mostly concentrated in big tech. And then it has just invited this incredible amount of debate and conversation as to what exactly was causing that. And there, the market was down a, a bit on Monday of this last week, like 500 points or something, a significant amount. Um, and there were all these people speculating it had to do with Ruth Bader Ginsburg dying. And I wasn't exactly sure what that meant. And I think, in fairness, what they're getting at is that that therefore made – more political gridlock likely or more uh, it elevated the noise and the toxicity, certainly fair enough, that it maybe was going to hurt this candidate or hurt that candidate and and whoever that candidate may be, it would theoretically be bad for markets. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say that probably isn't the case, that the the mere passing of Justice Ginsburg and the really kind of 
complicated melodramas that will take place around that in D.C. are pertinent to markets. I would say that if one wanted to do an all of the above kind of thesis here, that there is a question what the Fed's next move may be. We are going to go into an earnings season that will start in the middle of October, and there's some question now uh, because we're going in kind of blind without a whole lot of guidance from companies. Uh, Is it possible that we might actually, for the first time since COVID started, have companies underperform their really bad expectations, where thus far companies have mostly outperformed bad expectations? I think that – the election noise, the volatility around that, that certainly is a very legitimate thesis. The election tightening in the polls a little bit. It's tightened in some battleground states more than a little bit. It's tightened in some of the Senate races substantially. Um, those things do not help markets like because in this case the thesis often is, well, President Trump wants to cut taxes and Joe Biden wants to raise taxes and Biden was winning in the polls. And so that's bad for markets. And if Trump narrows it in the polls, that'd be better for markets. It's far too simplistic. I, I really I really believe that what's going on, first of all, the polls have not tightened anything meaningfully. Those that believe President Trump is going to win and and I'm of the camp that just has absolutely no idea. And so there's people who are adamant Trump will win. People are adamant Biden will win. And they profess that prediction to be separated from their own preference or aspiration. I'm skeptical that most people are able to do that, but but in fairness, some may. But regardless of what one objectively believes is going to happen, there is absolutely no way that the markets are able to price that in. So markets dropping 500 points in a day or rallying 500 points in a day, but which they did each of those things this week. It's not like one day a poll comes out and, and it's down and the next day it pulls up down and it's up. Like I said, it is the uncertainty of it that moves the volatility. Just the sort of concept, which I think is an extremely likely concept of not knowing who the winner will be going into Election Day and even on Election Day and potentially even for a few weeks after election day. Hopefully it would only be a few days. It could be a few weeks, but you know, who knows? Um, And as I've gone to great lengths, talk about that uncertainty is not merely applicable in a linear way to the presidential race. It's very applicable to the senatorial races. And I don't think that we're going to have two or three close ones. I think we may have four or five close ones and that's all together going to have a lot to do with what ends up happening uh, in the market. But in the meantime, I don't think up and down movements around an uncertain election outcome are going to go away. We're only near the end of September. The election is still, uh, let's call it at this point, uh, five, six weeks away. Okay, so you're going to have this dynamic out there along with the other dynamics. Are states uh, tightening unexpectedly around COVID lockdowns yet again um, in certain areas? Are states reverse tightening? You know, this morning as as I was finishing up Dividend Cafe, the announcement came of Florida going to stage three, reopening restaurants and and a lot of these types of things. So uh, a month ago, we were expecting things to be tighter in Florida. Now they're getting more open. So the markets have to kind of adjust. The economic activity is going to adjust around that. The question is, is it going to adjust favorably or unfavorably? That's another uncertain dynamic. If so, I've used this analogy before, but if someone had told me New York was going to be at less than 1% COVID positives and the restaurants were still going to be closed a couple months ago, I never would have believed it. And, and then if someone had said wet, back when Florida was at its peak level in new cases, that in a month Florida's restaurants are going to be reopening, I wouldn't have believed that. So you can have surprise tightenings and surprise openings all at once, and that's you know, it's part of our landscape right now. Uh, earnings, Fed, election, and and COVID economic activity, not COVID medical news. That's the most important thing. The heightened severity. Why are we going up or down 300 points, 500 points here and there, as opposed to those 2,000 and 3,000 point days? When we were going down two and 3,000 points, it was because we did not know the severity of the medical side. Right now, it's worth two or 300 points. So a tenth of that on intraday volatility because we don't know the policy response. We know that COVID's not going to go kill millions of Americans if we can protect our most vulnerable. We know of a 99-point fill-in-the-blank 
survival rate. We know of the uh, vast majority of positive tests being applied to people between the ages of 18 and 49 that are better for the most part, sometimes in a matter of days. That's not Pollyannish. That's all stuff that we didn't know six months ago that we know now. Okay, that's good. But that the market doesn't have to respond to the idea of uh, what was the famous headline, you know, with the hedge funder on CNBC, hell is coming back in March. Well, hell's not hell's not coming, but <laughs> the election is and, uh, you know, uh, ongoing uncertainty about what some mayors and governors will do. You know, that's all that's all legitimate. Um, and I don't expect that to change. So I want to be real clear. Uh, big tech valuations being excessive are the only thing I feel a lot of clarity around. Where the policy response to COVID goes, I just don't know. Where the election goes, I don't know. Um, I should add the Fed, uh, I feel a lot of clarity there. The Fed is going to backstop risk assets as they are now in a profound and totally um, abnormal way. But when I say abnormal, I mean abnormal for the first 70, 80 years of Fed. For the last 10 years and the next 10, this is actually the new normal, not abnormal. So I have I have pretty good clarity on the monetary policy backdrop to capital markets and and the um uh excuse me the the idea of covid not necessarily being um what we feared it would be medically but i think those other uncertainties are going to continue and therefore i expect market volatility to continue at least for another 4 or 5 6 weeks the problem with volatility is i did not say I expect it to go straight down uh, and I do not say expect to go straight up. I just have to always remind people volatility means two things, up and down. There's a couple really interesting charts at COVID and Markets today, excuse me, <laughs> Dividend Cafe, Freudian Slip, that I want to call to your attention. The um, level of money market funds, I did something I have not done yet, and I've tried to put these cash balance charts out there. Uh, I've done it at least three or four times since March to kind of reflect the roughly $4 trillion of sidelined investor capital that's out there. But what I did today is I broke it up of institutional and retail. And it's really important for people to be able to see the big increase in sidelined money that remains on the sideline. It's come down a little bit. So some has now been deployed as markets have recovered. But it is not all this retail money on the sideline with institutional money invested or vice versa. It's both. And and I think that speaks to the um, inevitability of an additional tailwind coming into risk assets. That There are pension funds and hedge funds and other institutional um, investors that require a return on capital obviously aren't going to and can't get it from cash. And so at some point they have to go play ball. And whenever that happens, it represents some uh, boost into the opportunity in risk assets. I believe stocks will end up being the primary beneficiary there. Um, another thing that I did, and of course, I devoted so much time and effort to that white paper I wrote that came out two weeks ago um, on the election that I don't want to overkill with data and information I already provided in the white paper. And yet I also had kind of a new... Um, area that, that came to me this morning in my in my research and writing that I want to share with you that the principle of it, the point of it, of uh, the your policy expectations and how then sometimes the way that that tran translates into market performance can really be surprising. And I used the example of, of some of where we would have expected President Trump's um, uh, preferred sectors to have done well and then the ones that that you would think he would have been in opposition to not doing well and how it proved to be the opposite in this uh, so far first term of his of his presidency but um, everyone who absolutely hates Trump and everyone who absolutely loves Trump would more than likely say that in a matter of the major policies he would have been in a different position than President Obama so all I've said so far is you can like Obama and dislike Trump or vice versa. It's irrelevant. My point is I don't know anyone that thinks that they were coming at this with a very similar policy portfolio that most people would have said for good or for bad on one or not the other, that they were at opposite ends of how they would approach some of these issues. And yet the top three performing sectors under President Obama were consumer discretionary, technology, and healthcare. 
And the top three performing sectors under President Trump were consumer discretionary technology and healthcare. And the uh, sectors that did worse under President Obama, the two worst performing sectors were financials and energy. And the two worst performing sectors under President Trump were financials and energy. So you really only have logically one of two conclusions you can draw, and I've already eliminated the first one. And the first one is that maybe President Obama and Trump had the same policies on those uh, in matters that would have affected those sectors. And I think that's an absurd conclusion. So the second conclusion would be, well, maybe the president is pretty overrated in how they affect the sector performance. And I think that that is the testimony of history and certainly the testimony of the last 12 years of presidential history. A couple other things that we cover at Dividend Cafe this week, um, more on the oil industry. My argument in a nutshell, we're, we're holding firm here with crude oil at $40 dollars. But uh, just a continued battered and bruised um, se sector as far as the stock performance goes around a lot of the upstream energy companies and midstream energy. And I lay it out as simply as I can. Do you believe that the trillions, and I, and I say that without a typo and without hyperbole, that the trillions of dollars of investment and opportunity and, spend and expenditures um, and transactions and fossil fuel it, uh, are, that ha are, are necessary um, to right now run civilization to feed energy needs around transportation and around heating and around cooling and around food. Do you believe that that's going away? in the next 10 years. Now, some would say 20, 30, 40. There's different opinions. There's different beliefs about when it should go away and different beliefs about when it will go away. And that's all fine. I'm not going there right now. I'm making a simple comment that I'm not aware of anyone who believes that's going away in the here and now. And therefore, to the extent that we, no one I'm aware of, believes that we're going to stop heating and cooling and feeding civilization can deny the market need for uh, particularly natural gas and crude oil. And uh, therefore, all the other arguments that one may make or not make around cleaner ways to use natural gas and, and all that different things, it's kind of irrelevant. All I'm getting at is that right now, if one believes that the multi-trillion dollar need for fossil fuels for the next 10 to 20 years is still going to be there for that period of time, uh, someone's going to make a lot of money from it. And it, in my mind, it would probably be the strongest and best companies in the sector that are right now at very distressed levels. So that would be the underlying thesis. Um, do I happen to believe that it's still a multi-generational opportunity set? I, I do. But, but that's kind of irrelevant to the point now. And because no one I'm aware of would deny anything I've said so far. In, in a shorter horizon. And, and I think that should be a very succinct and uh, digestible understanding of what that investment thesis would be around the transportation, the safe, environmentally safe and economically efficient transportation of um, natural gas and crude oil in our country. A lot of going on uh, in the economy, and I think the economic update of the week is is somewhat meaty this week, just around durable goods orders that really outperformed expectations in August. Um, the chart of the week looks at overall global trade um, and how significantly quicker its rebound has come out of the COVID moment than it did out of the financial crisis in 2009. And yet that's true, even though many of the economies of the world, including here in our own country, are not even fully reopened yet. And yet we already see a really robust reanimation of exports out of China, of how American household import demand, um, durable goods orders. You see a lot of pretty healthy economic activity. The question will be if it's sustained. Um, if this is just a mere little blip of a rebound out of the second quarter um, problems that we had, then that will not be optimistic. I will not be stay optimistic around that. But thus far, it really appears that a lot of that data is outperforming expectations. Um, 
Let me go ahead and leave it there. Uh, we do have a debate you may have heard on Tuesday night of next week, September 29th, will be the first of the three presidential debates. That should be good for a little fodder here in the Dividend Cafe. I'm sure I'll be covering it to some degree next week. We'll see if it moves the needle, um, that, you know, if, if there's any kind of market impact around it. Uh, but, um, you know, the, I, I think at this point you, you should be pretty familiar with my overall thesis around markets. Uh, I think we have not one but three or four categories that are legitimately um, ambiguous in the short-term direction. I expect that to be true of markets, but that is true with markets having achieved this kind of 27,000 range instead of a 22,000 range. And so markets did recover a great deal of pricing and and to have gotten up back above 28,000 and experienced some kind of up and down movements, I don't think it should be a surprise to anybody. And and ultimately, I made this uh, uh, point in COVID and markets this week. You have to understand that with equity markets now moving the way they have and the bond yield not moving at all, that's the new normal that's where you lose the opportunity for bonds to provide risk mitigation around equity volatility. And of course, by the math of it, you already have lost the income from those bonds with yields at sub 1%. So our uh, Dividend Cafe next Friday will be dedicated to what we are internally here at the Bonson Group calling, I guess it's not internal because I'm telling you, um, Operation Magnify, where we are looking to kind of restructure, reorganize the way we're presenting um, our portfolio construction, but it is not replacing anything we've ever believed. It is magnifying long-held principles, magnifying long-held beliefs, and seeking just a better contemporary application of the normal environment, the new normal environment in which we live, which has everything to do with interest rates and what that is going to mean to the economy for the next 10 years. Thank you, as always, for listening to The Dividend Cafe. Reach out anytime with any questions. We will uh, get you your very final COVID and markets missive and podcast next Tuesday and look forward to introducing you to the D.C. today on Thursday, October 1, followed by another weekly Dividend Cafe on Friday. Uh, And with that, I will say have a wonderful weekend. 